Hello, everyone. Welcome to ICANX Talks. My name is Lan Fu, a professor from the Australian National University, and I will be the moderator tonight. So today is the 161 ICANX Talks, and it's great pleasure to have Professor Krush Kalanta Zedi from University of Sydney. So join us um, is the panelist tonight is uh, Professor Michael Dickey from North Carolina State University. Of course, uh, Martin Seal also from North Carolina State University. Also Professor Tobin Denek from RMIT University of Australia and uh, Dr. Ming Wang from EPFL. So at first, let me introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Krosh Kalanda Zede, from, um, who is the head of School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineer at the University of Sydney. He's also one of the Australian Research Council Laureate Fellows of 2018. Professor Kalanda Zede was a professor of chemical engineering at the University of New South Wales of Australia. Prior to that, he also is a professor uh, at RMIT University. Um, Crush is involved in research in the fields of analytical chemistry, material science, um, gastro and uh, gastroenterology, electronics, and the sensors, and also has co authored of over 500 highly cited scientific papers. He's a member of the editorial boards of many prestigious journals, and also um, he's best known for his work on ingestible sensors, um, liquid metals, and two-dimensional um, semiconductors. He led the invention of an ingestible chemical sensors, um, a, a human gas sensor capsule, as a, one of the breakthroughs in the field of medical, uh, medical devices. Uh, Professor Kanata Zeta has uh, received many um, international awards, the, the most notable, the recent one, 2020 Robert Boyle Ro Prize of Royal Society of Chemistry. So, Professor Kananda Zeta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. So, let me see how I can share my presentation here. Okay. Fantastic, I found it, share. Are you able to see this? Yes, yep. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction again. So uh, basically, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, catalysis using liquid metals. And I call it green catalysis because uh, basically what we are, the quest we have, what we are after is about making everything as green as possible, make sure that the catalysis does the job and as strong as possible. So what are these uh, liquid metals? I just have a little bit of problem with my uh, presentation. Let me just fix it here. Fantastic, it's good now. So liquid metals, what are they? Uh, look, uh, people have different definitions. It's a definition that uh, Torben is uh, here today. And uh, he was my colleague, he was my group at the time. And I see we are very close colleagues. And at the time we were talking about it, we said, okay, let's have a, a little bit of different definition for that. So it's a kind of a non-conventional definition. We define it, uh, all these porous transition metals, as you see the blue ones, the metals or the alloys, uh, gallium, indium, thin, kalium, lead, and bismuth. We define all of them as anything that uh, melts under 330 degrees. So the conventional liquid metal is something maybe under 50 degrees. You heat it up a little bit, becomes liquid. Here we said, if anything, we can heat up and melt with something that we have access in a kitchen at low cost, low technology, melt it down. Uh, we call that liquid metal. Now, uh, it goes to the combination of materials that uh, alloys that come from a combination with uh, these kind of six main elements, 
together with mercury, unfortunately, we don't have much access to mercury and also cadmium. The considered hazardous, I was hoping to all these legislations, all these uh, uh, stories about mercury go back more than the past few years. It hasn't happened yet. I see that some, some of the institutions have more access these days to mercury, which is fantastic. It's possible to use it rather safely in comparison to many other chemicals. Regardless, we're talking about these six elements. We can mix and match them together with other metallic elements. We heat them up. They can be melted together, dissolved into each other. And at lower temperature, uh, we can dissolve also uh, post-transition metals into each other and also zinc group metals into post-transition metals and uh, aluminum also and some of the rest of the metals. Even uh, elements like carbon also can dissolve to uh, low concentrations and make really interesting alloys. If this is the history of human being anyway. Let's go back to molten metals. They become fluid, they become flexible, and most importantly, they are electronic solvents. They can, as I mentioned, they can alloy and mix with other metals at different concentrations, and they're highly thermally and electrically conductive. So we have access to free electrons and access to uh, basically elements that they have lost these electrons and electrons are shared between them that can move around. So uh, we have electrons that can move around very fast. Then we have the basically cores that can move much slower than the electrons. Gallium applications. I just wanted to drop a fun uh, number here. Uh, when we were doing our research in 2021, we purchased huge amount of uh, uh, gallium. So we're talking now about gallium, the representative of these post-transition metals. And uh, I was contacted by basically authorities from America. Hey, why are you buying this much gallium? Yeah, by uh, October, November, they said I had purchased the 0.015% of total production of gallium in the whole world in 2021 for the lab. So that was a fun fact. So we consumed and we wasted sorts of uh, lots of gallium in the lab. But uh, in reality, apart from the papers which are published based on gallium, all this flexible electronics, uh, things about batteries are becoming very big, uh, tactile logic. The reality is gallium in engineering and for uh, consumer products is base of light, uh, white LEDs. So what happened that, in fact, we make uh, blue LEDs from gallium arsenide, gallium nitride. We put a uh, fluorescence material, phosphorescence material on the surface. They change the color from blue to yellow. So yellow comes out of the system. Some of the blue light is also escaped. Yellow plus this blue give us white light. So if I talk about Australia, 50% of all lights in Australia are based on this kind of uh, low energy uh, gallium based light. Uh, these are fantastic. If you remember a few years ago, a few people won the Nobel Prize for uh, the development and perfection of this kind of LEDs. So really they change your life. They reduce the consumption of energy inside houses. Now, the second is indium. Fantastic, interesting material. Why gallium uh, melting point is about 30 degrees. Indium is about 150 degrees. Uh, the ITO glass, indium tin oxide, is made of indium. Uh, what are they? Uh, basically, when you look at this, uh, uh, mobile a mobile phone or the monitor in front of you, a big part of uh, LEDs across this uh, uh, monitor is made of, of course, the gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, but the conductive uh, indium tin oxide film, which is B 
behind them and allow the light to pass through at the same time conductivity is provided for the LEDs, these bi, indium, and tin mixes. So what happened that these are uh, oxide, transparent, and at the same time conductive. Um, other fun factors about indium, indium, because of interesting uh, uh, melting point it has, has been traditionally used for ball bearings in uh, motor racing. Uh, and sprinklers, and sprinklers as are in your offices, uh, a metal made of indium, an alloy made of indium is called fizz metal, that melts at about 61 degrees. When the temperature of the room goes above that, it melts, connects two wires, then you have this shower to distinguish the fire. The other things are again like uh, gallium, we have indium based uh, diodes, but laser diodes. And also a few years ago, we had the second generation photovoltaics, copper, indium, gallium, selenide, thin films. Um, it's sort of not a hot topic anymore. And as I mentioned, the fire detectors. Now, other fun factors about bismuth and tin. Bismuth is relatively safe material. It's used in medicine in uh, bismuth containing compounds are actually used in medicine for the stomach, for uh, stomach ache and also diarrhea. Bismuth oxide is used a lot in fireworks. It gives a fizzing and crackling sound. And it's also in cosmetics, especially in eyeshadow, some compounds of bismuth. The melting point is about 270 degrees. Tin melting point is 230. Tin cans are all over, or tin roof. Basically, they are very tin, is a very safe material. It's very friendly with food. Tin is used in making windows. We can easily melt tin, become the smoothest surface, and then basically put the molten SiO2 on the surface of it and make glass for windows, very smooth glasses. And the last one factor is uh, before 2016, the statues of Oscar statues were made of an alloy of tin. It was coated with gold. This is why they look gold. Let's go back to liquid metals. For instance, gallium. You melt it at 30 degrees and you can use it as a solvent. Now, the difference between this electronic solvent and conventional solvent is the surface of this electronic solvent is layered. What does it mean? You expose it to ambient oxygen, the surface become oxide. We can then harvest that oxide, make semiconductors or mass insulators, depending on what other materials you add to this liquid metal. Or use a liquid metal as conventional solvents, add secondary material, dissolve into it. Basically, very similar to water, sugar, and salt. We heat up water, we can add more and more sugar and salt into this, then cool it down, it's super saturated. Uh, uh, a liquid basically allow the liquid uh, allow the salt and sugar to be crystallized and come out. Uh, same here, you heat up liquid metal, you can dissolve more and more of the secondary material, secondary element into it. The big difference and the big advantage here is that the secondary material is generally a metallic element. So it's the best solvent for metallic elements going into it and make basically different kind of nano or micro particles in it. Now the challenge is how to take them out. Okay. So we are talking about the challenges. Uh, are, we, are, are we using these liquid metals in liquid state? Do we crystallize? Do we go to crystallization? Are we going to use that layer on the top, make other type of a structure or phase separation? We cool down liquid metals, becomes solidified, and phases sometimes separate, sometimes make binary compounds and rest. Let's talk about phase separation and how we use, use, use it for making metallic materials. Nucleation and phase separation in bulk. So it was a work. Um, again, we had a discussion here with Torben. Torben is present here. And I had a student, so we told the student, hey, give it a try. Go and dissolve different kinds of metals at high temperature into gallium or yin or uh, you know, other solvents, other alloys of gallium. 
And let's try to take them out. How to take them out? The surface tension of gallium is very high. All this liquid metal surface tension is very high. The trick was applying a voltage in a secondary solvent, for instance, NaOH included in the solvent. And when you apply the first, uh, the, the voltage surface tension becomes very low. Now, uh, a person who is also today in the panel, Michael Dickey, was one of the people who started this concept and he published many papers here and another paper following that concept. Now, it was advantageous for us because when you make the surface tension very small and you put everything on the top of a filter, this liquid metal passes through the filter, but the solid material, which we super saturate and put all these metals, uh, they cannot pass through. So all the materials that crystalline in crystalline in, inside the liquid metal remain the other side of the filter, and we can harvest them. Uh, it depends on the material and depends on the metal that you're introducing. It can be any of these crystals. Now, we did lots of theoretical calculation computation, and uh, our collaborators from Auckland and from RMIT, they showed that the, the growth of actually metals inside liquid metals is very, very different from conventional solvents, so like organic solvents or HOA solutions that we have. The surface growth, the facets of crystals that we see inside liquid metal, and now by extracting the met metallic material that we make inside liquid metal, these facets, they grow very differently, sometimes very fast. It depends on the condition that we apply. Here is one of the beautiful examples. We call this snowflake-like metallic zinc crystals. They're actually very similar to snowflakes, but they were born, they were created inside liquid metals. As you see, we changed the zinc concentrations and different times, different days. And by changing these two parameters, we get this variety of zinc snowflakes. Well, this part was for fun, but in reality, you can control the facets, you can control the growth of the secondary material. For instance, you can have platinum, you can create layered platinum inside liquid metal and extract it. It's a kind of a phase that making it very, very difficult. Now, let's go to the next one. Phase separation on the surface of liquid metal. Okay, so we talked about applying a voltage and trying to extract things from inside out, but I talked about supersaturation. You don't need also resort to supersaturation to create this nanomaterials inside. You can perturb the surface using voltage again, or any other basically uh, energy that you apply to the surface and, and create nanomaterials or templated materials onto the surface. Here are two examples. The first one, we add some tin into gallium and we apply some voltage. So the uh, voltage bring this secondary tin to the surface, immediately make the uh, nucleization happen and these uh, small nanoparticles of tin come out. So this is why gradually the liquid here becomes turbid, darker and darker. So that dark thing is a metallic tin. The other example is indium. Surprise, surprise, indium didn't make those kind of uh, uh, very homogeneous distribution of the secondary material that comes out. And instead we see some flakes. So depends on the condition that we apply and depends on the condition that actually uh, the secondary material produced on, for the perturbation of the surface, we get different shapes. Here we are, for instance, zinc come to the surface. It templates itself to the surface, very similar to indium, and make a two-dimensional material that come out. So the surface of liquid metal is very smooth and it's expected. On the other side, Tin, for instance, when it comes to the surface, it goes, nucleation happens and comes at small nanoparticles that come out, nanoparticles which are covered with tin oxide. Other things can happen. This uh, video that you see 
is an observation that uh, one of my group members at the time had, Chiang Bo Tang. So he realized if you have very, very low concentration of bismuth and you push the surface of liquid metal, suddenly you have this uh, solidification front and a pattern that comes out of it. Okay, so as you see, this front wave moves and moves from one side to another, actually it's very slow. And then you use a microscope or electron microscope and look at these patterns, you see how beautiful they are. They follow what we heard in the past, what's called as Turing patterns. The parallel one, the simplest one, and uh, then it becomes dotty and becomes zigzag and parallel to each other, can be parallel with dots and holes inside them. But the funniest thing is, although we start at super, super low concentrations on off, for instance, this one here, we're talking about 0.01%. The surface become enriched with this one. Now, these are the phenomena that we look at it. And why this is happening, our colleagues again at RMIT, they did molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, and they realized, okay, what's happening? For instance, if we do this uh, poking of the surface in an environment that doesn't have oxygen, surface patterning doesn't happen. Because although we have, for instance, secondary metal, which is bismuth here, they attach to each other and they make these nanoparticles. At the end, these nanoparticles remain in a liquid state of gallium and move around, so they don't make any structure. While if uh, this poking happens in ambient air, we have oxygen on the surface, and the surface oxide is produced, all these patterns stick themselves to this uh, surface oxide and stay there. So we have a stable pattern. All right. So some of the mysteries were solved. The reality is we can do other things as well. So we are starting to understand that we have some control over the surface. The world of the surface of liquid metal is enigmatic and we have control over the uh, core of liquid metal. We can extract things out of them. But before I jump into uh, looking at catalysis, I start also with conventional construction of materials out of liquid metals. You can even put liquid metals together. Uh, for instance, in this example, we had bismuth and tin. We combine them, make alloys at different concentrations, and we sonicated them in the secondary, for instance, organic material, and eventually uh, extracted these uh, uh, nano droplets that are created, cool them, and use them. Now you can uh, oxidize them as well and use them as catalytic material. That's another thing. So this was done by Jian Botang. Uh, now, something which very interesting was about the concentrations of tin and bismuth. So if you go back to the phase diagram of bismuth and tin, as you see at 53%, at 57% bismuth and 43% uh, tin, we have a eutectic system that have, uh, has a low melting point of 139 degrees. Uh, basically, when you mix this together, uh, the temperature melting point of uh, bismuth is 271, tin is 232, and at this uh, eutectic point is the lowest temperature that you can experience. Okay, look at the experience, look at the differences of the samples that we obtained from different combination of tin and bismuth. It's very interesting. When we cool it down, so we heat them up at 300 degrees, at 20% uh, tin and 80% bismuth, we get this very well-ordered crisscross of plates of tin and bismuth. All right, very interesting. At about 80% tin and 20% uh, bismuth, we get rods of, for instance, bismuth into a, an ocean of tin. Everything is highly ordered, everything is highly crystal crystalline, right? But in your eutectic system, when you cool it down, because you go from a very high entropy system and the, the whole system doesn't have enough time to form itself into ordered crystals, we get these fibrous structures. So we meant, and uh, we look at what we are obtaining. For instance, if we sonicate and cool down, the surface becomes Highly entropic, we get tin oxide, tin dioxide, and bismuth oxide. If we don't uh, sonicate the system and look at the surface of the ball, 
you have only tin oxide. Okay, so we have two things. One is cooling down and phase separation. And one is even during phase separation, if we add more energy and for instance, mechanical energy, we go to other kind of phases and we see other systems. So it becomes very complicated. But in reality is if you start with your tactic system and you cool it down and you look uh, with TM as what the structures you are obtaining, the TM says that we have loss of line and surface defects and edge dislocations and loss of boundaries. Is it good? For catalysis is very good. So gradually we're going to catalysis, but this is com conventional catalysis. So conventional one is you take a metallic material that's covered with some metal oxides, like in this case, it has to be very small. We sonicated, we made everything very small. And we generally look at, okay, what we are making in this case, we bubble CO2 as electrochemical reduction. Uh, for CO2, we bubble it into an electrolyte and we produce formate. And we did test, we realized that, ooh, the best uh, uh, basically sample that we obtained is a sample that came from the highly entropic uh, eutectic system. And it was 78% for the efficiency at the lowest possible voltage of 1.1 volt. Now, uh, why this happened? Of course, we had lots of defects, lots of boundaries, and they helped in uh, basically uh, enhancing the, and having more control over reaction intermediates. So this is why we could produce more formate. We can do other cool things with this. For instance, you can, here is about uh, field alloy. What is that? It's made of 51% indium, 32% bismuth, and 60% thin. You put them together, it becomes fields metal, the melting point of fields metal is 61 degrees. Again, a eutectic combination of these three metals. All right, what is very good because we could melt everything at low temperature and sonicate it. This is why it's like we were too lazy to go to high temperatures. And it was a proof of concept. So we sonicated them, we got these beautiful balls. And then what we wanted to do, to do some foaming. And foaming is very similar. The thing happens very similarly, but this time we want to do it, do it at low temperature in the lab. So this is our combination. We made the, these uh, balls and, and we put in a solution and drop the solution into sodium bicarbonate plus HCl at different concentrations of HCl. So foaming happens, depends on how much acid you have. This is just classical chemical engineering, how we make metallic foams. Uh, at 0.1 mole of HCl, 1 mole HCl, 10 mole HCl. Uh, obviously, if acidity is lower, the foaming happens more gradually. As you see, it's becoming bigger and bigger. And it takes a minute or two. But if you have lots of acid, 10 mole acid, you see what happens. Bang, you get the foam so rapidly and everything on the surface is aged. Okay, so we have the foam, we have the catalytic foam, and we wanted to see what we exactly had. So the core of this foam is metallic. The surface, if it's uh, low acidity, we get all the oxide. If it's high acidity, we only get indium oxide on the surface and some metallic indium. And we use them for different applications for photoelectrocatalysis, applying the voltage together with light, we get fantastic uh, efficiency. We could, for instance, uh, get rid of a dye in a much shorter time than only using visible light and uh, not applying the voltage or applying just the voltage. We use it for, again, CO2 electroconversion, catalysis, the formate uh, production from CO2. Here, even the Faraday efficiency was much higher and at lower voltage. And for something again cool, uh, having water with E. coli and pass it through uh, uh, this uh, basically foam that we make, metallic foam, we could apply the voltage and we could uh, go under the uh, splitting voltage for water, which was 0.8 volts and we could kill about 50% of the bacteria, and we put several of these uh, filters and it go to almost zero or increase the bacteria, uh, increase the voltage a bit more and 
basically have a little bit of water splitting, but at the same time, removing the bacteria. Now, one of the issues is indium is super expensive. We talk about many thousands of dollars per kilogram. So making this catalytic form is not something that's cost effective. What should we do? Uh, we try to play with the concentration of indium. Actually, if you look at this beautiful image of EDS of one small droplet of uh, uh, indium, uh, tin and uh, basement, and only 1% indium, you see that even at only 1% indium, indium come to the surface. Basement and tin remain actually separated, but on the surface we have this basement. It's like we have the very high, uh, uh, we are very lucky this basement come to the surface because we can do the foaming again at a uh, uh, relatively low temperature of under 200 degrees, basement melts and basically put all these balls together and make the foam for us. Now, heterostructure from nucleation to single atom catalysis. We talk about solid uh, catalyst. There's a conventional, the only thing that we do in the past few pages, we uh, basically took liquid metal and we use liquid metal as a solvent, or we use conventional processes of chemical engineering and metallurgy and liquid metals and made the catalytic structures. Here we say, okay, this is stop. Let's go back and use uh, uh, this liquid metals in liquid state for catalysis. So basically it was the kind of discussion at the time, again, to urban, that time was there together with uh, Dona Estrafel Zade. Uh, she was a postdoc in the lab. Actually, I suggested them, hey, would you please go and see whether it's possible to catalyze organic material on the surface of liquid metal? So they didn't listen to me. They said, oh, they want to do CO2 conversion because they wanted to, because that's apparently the problem for a human being. And uh, also, uh, we had Torman, who had lots of interest in cerium. So uh, basically, what they did, they put cerium into gallium, and something very interesting happened. Actually, when we sonicated it, and we look at it using it, uh, TEM, high-resolution TEM, we see uh, at 3%, at 2%, this cerium reservoir, but in solid state, could stay, could be nucleation of cerium, we could see them inside liquid metal, as you see, uh, surrounding by this gallium liquid. On the surface, cerium was winning the oxidation and going to the surface and covering the surface of the whole uh, combination as cerium. So here we are. What should we do? Electrochemical reaction. Put it with large droplets. Again, this is not a scalable, but it's a very cool uh, physics and uh, understanding of the fundamental. So uh, cerium oxide, sub-stoichiometry on the surface, and uh, we have CO2 bubbled around the electrolyte, which is covering this uh, basically droplet with cerium in it. Surface become oxidized because the CO2, the bond of C, uh, carbon and oxygen is broken. Carbon remains on the surface and oxygen is getting released, and uh, oxygen goes and oxidizes the surface, but because we apply voltage, we have uh, the catalytic uh, circular process. Now, something very interesting happens is that this process doesn't stop. If you have a solid electrode after a few minutes, this reaction stops because the surface is covered with carbonaceous material and flakes. So you don't have access to the catalytic material that interacts with CO2 and everything stops. In reality, if you look at on the right side, B figure, the black uh, current in time shows that in this case, when we have, we're using liquid metals, the process doesn't stop. And uh, why? Because when we look at the surface of liquid metal, we see these flakes are formed on the surface, but they keep naturally uh, flake off the surface. We have self-exfoliation from the surface. 
So eventually they come off, they don't cover the surface, and this reaction continues. Um, the reaction, we really studied it. It's very hard to scale this up because the surface area is very small. So the challenge is how to uh, increase the total uh, throughput from this. Now, uh, this is not the discussion that I want to uh, present tonight, but I want to present you uh, present to you other possibilities from liquid metals. Now, let's go to the next one. Here, we uh, do a DFT, and the DFT, uh, density functional theory calculation, showed that when we have CH1, so that was about CO1, come to the surface of liquid metal, if we have gallium, not much happens. If you have tin and indium inside liquid metal, something should happen. So we have better chance for CH dissociation. And also the other thing that shows that the C carbon, which is produced, goes inside, but cannot remain dissolved inside liquid metal. It makes CC bond. So very interesting prediction. So we started from uh, precursors of carbon, bring them under the surface, we apply some voltage for activation. We're talking about methanol, ethanol, isopropanol, acetone, acetonitrile, and pyridine. So they have nitrogen inside them, this organic material. And look at the difference. When we apply a voltage, when we have only gallium in a liquid that contains, for instance, one of these fuels, uh, when uh, it doesn't contain any fuel, nothing happens. Uh, when we con it contains some of these fuels, then suddenly we have the formation of something black on the surface that self exfoliates and goes and we can easily harvest it. Okay, carbonaceous materials, fantastic. We started to look at it. We realized it's highly defective. And then we look at it using TM, high resolution TM. We realize it's highly porous. Actually, it's holy, extremely holy. So if you want to make a battery using this carbonaceous material, it's the holiest carbon that you can create ever. Nothing can be full of pores more than this. You look at all different organic precursors, uh, as you see, for instance, also the state. If you have only gallium, current is how much. If you have gallium, indium current is how much. How activation happens, which one of them is more active. Or even you can make non-holy surface the, the holy structure was happening because during the formation of this carbonaceous material of the surface, the formation was happening, as you see. But you want to avoid it. You want to make perfect graphitic material uh, and highly reduced graphene. What you do is you just paint a liquid metal on the surface of electrodes. The surface cannot be deformed anymore. And this uh, graphic metal, when it's formed on the surface, it safe exfoliates and goes and lands on the substrate. In this case, it's graphene. And if you start with a material that, for instance, has nitrogen, a uh, graphitic material doped with nitrogen, as you know, it's a very highly catalytic material. So you can make it super porous, highly catalytic, and use it for a different application, either battery storage or catalysis. The reality is we're talking about nucleation and you're talking about also catalysis in atomic level in liquid. So we had the bulk of liquid. Uh, what we did, we added platinum at very low concentrations at relatively low temperature. We're talking about less than 100 degrees. And this platinum come to the surface and it can do the catalysis for you. And this catalysis for the same a uh, mass of uh, platinum is super active. If you have that mass and use it for catalysis, for instance, we use a uh, pyrogallon here and uh, polymerize it. We realize that, for instance, if you can, if you want to do it with the same mass of platinum, solid platinum, uh, in comparison to when put, we put platinum, the same amount in gallium, we could get extraordinary enhancement in reaction. We're talking about three to five orders of magnitude. Now we did, uh, together with our uh, colleagues, uh, all the uh, computational analysis, 
something really interesting happened. So platinum was coming to the surface. Platinum remained segregated because each platinum uh, atom was uh, surrounded by six, seven gallium. So this gallium uh, surrounding platinum, stopping platinum from nucleation, making clusters. So it was single atom, and at the same time, platinum atom make them activated this gallium atoms. So they become platinum-like uh, atoms. Very interesting phenomenon, very interesting observations. Now, non-crystalline nanoparticles. You're gradually going to the final pages. So this is our newest publication uh, by Jun Matang, a postdoctoral fellow in my group. And we said, okay, we have seen all these cool uh, properties. How about if uh, we look at severing bonds at where we want? Is it possible? Let's uh, start with different concentration of nickel and tin into gallium and see what we can make. So we're talking about elevated temperature about 150 degrees to 200 degrees to make sure that we have full solubility of tin and nickel at, for instance, half a percent. So we don't have solid. It's really a liquid. Now, we immerse them in an organic precursor. This time it could be canola or decane. Decane, we use it as a proof of concept to understand, but canola has some oxygen in it too. And it's very complicated, the structure, organic structure. We can, uh, but decane is very simple. It's just a, a large, uh, connected carbon chain. So we started a computational study. We brought this uh, carbon chain to the surface and something very interesting happened because it's nickel and, uh, 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 and tin atoms. They can move around. They can be affected by the decaying the strands that come to the surface. Actually, these decaying strands have some charge. They sort of bring the nickel and uh, a tin to the surface, or this nickel and tin, when randomly they're answering the surface, they get locked. So some chain of uh, these takings, they start interacting with the presence of nickel. It's a catalysis for CC bond, and it severs it, uh, as you see at this point, at, for instance, if one of the caverns, not at the very end, but like three to the end, and very interestingly and selectively, it makes propylene and shorter hydrocarbons. These shorter hydrocarbons continue this interaction. So we saw something very interesting. We have dynamic reconstruction of the liquid metal uh, atoms, the liquid metal on the surface. We have some mirroring effects that comes from decaying onto these atoms. And then we have uh, bonds that break down and new bonds which are formed, and they can be very selective. So this is what I was saying, that it's a possibility that we go to this liquid metal and we make this super catalyst that never existed, or we never imagined it, because everything is based on solid catalyst for human being. And we can do everything selectively. Here, propylene is a feedstock. is very important for us. It's, for instance, the gas for us, uh, Melt the building, and uh, it's used in many different uh, industries. And now we can uh, we can make it as so such a low energy. So this is why I was saying that this liquid metals in liquid form, we can combine tin and nickel. We can combine copper. We can combine any other metals into them at different uh, concentrations, and make any catalytic system that you want. It's very easy. To, to make them, they're atomically dispersed, so they're ultimate catalysis. And here we are, this is the evidence that we painted liquid metal on the surface of these uh, uh, meshes, and we put them in the canola oil, 200 degrees, and we have this propylene produced coming out for several days. So, very easy. The other concept is under review, uh, is okay. And we do also high entropy. We did a calculation, molar entropy. We start with something that everyone looks at, like gold, platinum, palladium, and copper. It is a pseudo kind of uh, uh, high entropy alloys because 
The base is gallium, 98%, but the rest are in half percent, but equal amount we combine them together. So gallium is really not the high entropy. Component of it is a solvent for them. And we look at the molar entropy, and as you see, when we have half a percent gold and copper and platinum palladium, we get this highest entropy. Is it really, uh, and that's the calculation. Is it really working? Yes, it does actually. When we do XRD, we see something very interesting. Although we have some, uh, for instance, gold and copper and palladium coming out, suddenly platinum gallium peaks that we expected to see disappear. So when, anytime you put platinum into gallium, you should get platinum gallium binary systems. And in this case, we don't have it. So that means platinum really atomically disperse even at half a percent at near room temperature into gallium. You know, cat uh, we did cathode luminescence and we see, yes, it's really atomic dispersion. If actually you do the calculation, you see the uh, molar entropy of this system is as close as possible to solid platinum. That means uh, at one, uh, sorry, to the liquid platinum at about one uh, 2,000 degrees. So at room temperature, just by combining this together, we obtain something that can give us the same catalytic performance as platinum. Uh, and here is the evidence. For the same mass of platinum, we actually get uh, this very incredibly great Harris performance. So here we are at the end of the talk. I would like to say these liquid metals are majestic or incredibly interesting. And I use the word enigmatic, perplexing materials. Our uh, background knowledge still about them is very limited. Almost anything you do, you see some extraordinary phenomena. Not extraordinary, they are in nature but the phenomenon that as human beings we have not seen before. We can use the binary system and study them. We can use high entropy liquid alloys and study them. We can uh, expose the surface uh, and get oxide because surface layering happens in surface of liquid metals. You can use them as normal solvents and uh, you can crystallize everything inside the bulk and then extract them by breaking the surface tension. The surface property of liquid metals is very, very different from the bulk. And as you saw, we can break bonds, the hydrogenation, we can put bonds together like CC bonds. It depends on what you add to the system of liquid metal. As adding everything to liquid metals is very easy. Heat them up 100, 200 degrees, just mix them on the top of your cook, uh, in the kitchen, on the top of cooktop or in the oven. So basically, I would like to thank all of you who are listening to me. I would like to thank uh, Isaac for the invitation for the talk tonight. And uh, tonight, of course, it can be daytime in other countries, tonight in Australia. And I would like to thank panel, who are going to have this discussion with me in the next uh, half an hour. And again, acknowledging all those who helped me, Torben is here, and the rest of the group in the past and present, collaborators at different universities, Michael is here too, and also the grant providers. And again, one more time, I would like to thank the audience who are here uh, for the past uh, 40, 50 minutes listening to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Prosh, for a really fascinating talk. I'm sure the panel is very keen to uh, join the discussion now. So let me just introduce you uh, our panel tonight. Um, so our first panelist is Professor Michael DK from North Carolina State University, um, who is the Camille and Henry Dreyfus Professor in the Department of Chemical Bio molecular engineering at um, North Carolina State University. He received his uh, bachelor degree in chemist, chemical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology in 1999 and a PhD from the University of Texas 2006 under the guidance of Professor Grant Wilson. 
From 2006 to 2008, he was a postdoc fellow in the lab of Professor George Whitesides at Harvard University. And then Michael completed a sabbatical in, at Microsoft in 2016 and EPFL in 2023. Uh, Michael's research interests include soft matter, or soft and stretchable device. Our next panelist, um, of course, is our friend uh, Martin Thiel from North Carolina State University, who doesn't probably need an introduction, so I will save our time. Sorry, Martin, otherwise we'll have to introduce many times. <laughs> and then, of course, the Toby and Danik from RMIT University, who um, is the Associate Professor at the School of Engineering at RMIT. Um, his early research focuses on charge transfer process in disensitized solar cell. And after joining RMIT, he shifted his uh, work towards the synthesized and application of two-dimensional materials. His current research is focused on li liquid metal chemistry, where he's exploring fundamental phenomena as well as application in synthesis, electronics, and catalysis. And Dr. Nix currently leads a research group of 17 HDR students and four postdoc fellows. He has published over 140 peer-reviewed journal and with H-index for 57. He holds several patents and pursues research translation in areas of uh, liquid metal catalysts. And our next challenger tonight um, is um, Dr. Ming Wang who is a postdoc at um, EPFL. Her research focuses on developing molecular-based uh, catalysts for small molecule conversion, like CO2 reduction reaction. She obtained her PhD from the University of Paris and a master's degree from Shandong University. She's passionate about a continuing um, innovative research, understand, develop, and finally fabricate practical catalysts towards energy technology for society. And of course, she has published a um, um, few journal, uh, many published work in nature communications and etc. So, oh, Ming Wang, I think we got a picture wrong. So, Ming Wang, you'll see her from the screen very soon. So, now let me um, introduce all the panelists to, to the stage now. All right. So, now, Ming, sorry for about uh, messing up your photo. <laughs> now you can, yeah. everyone. Can see you on the screen. So uh, please go ahead uh, uh, to ask your question first. Yeah, first, thanks, thanks for your introduction and thanks for the professor's talk. I, as always, I'm always inspired by the it. By, by. So, but still, I, was, I have some questions. First, I would like to know, uh, because you introduced the T, you tactic uh, alloy for the CO2R. It's cool that you can produce that much formate, right? And also, as you have explained, it's because of the defects, the boundaries in the uh, on the alloys. But I would like to know what's its morphology or the defects boundaries during or after the electrolysis. Okay, that, that's a good question. Um, it's not presented here, but uh, we actually checked the morphologies uh, after catalysis because it was a question by one of the reviewers. Um, Okay, of, of course, it's impossible to know exactly what happened to that location that we saw before and after. But on average, we could see that they remained highly intact in the solid state that they were. It, it was a combination of, that example was a combination of, for instance, bismuth and uh, tin. The surface was made of uh, oxide, for instance, bismuth and tin, right? Yeah. Bismuth and tin oxide. And they are, well, it depends. You put them into, for instance, acidic environment, they were relatively stable. In basic environment, they were not as stable. So, uh, and then what's happening to the core? If the surface was protected, the core was protected. So for some of the catalysis condition, we're quite good in solid state, for others not. But uh, as we know, for instance, tin, uh, um, uh, uh, tin basically sponges are used for catalysis as a base for catalysis. So this is it wasn't any different. For indium was very different. Indium was not as stable, of course. When we're talking about making the foams from uh, um, only 
high concentration of indium, yeah, we have some problems. But then we reduced the concentration of indium, everything was more and more safe. Yeah, it's cool. Thanks. Thanks for your explanation. And then Smil, yeah. I have another question. Because as you said, okay, for the teen gallon uh, alloy at least is stable. So it's fine because we know the gallium is the one of the expensive metals, right? So regarding the further application, is it is it that easy to scale up the senses or to Yeah, it's it? always the problem with gallium. It remains the problem with gallium forever. And uh, actually we try to scale up and uh, you know many things with gallium any time we had any problem with losing the smallest amount of gallium or becoming oxidized, the smallest amount of gallium is oxidation. If you want to reduce it back to gallium, it's loss of energy. Uh, gallium is just very expensive. We are talking about thousands of dollars per kilogram. Uh, it's a problem. So eventually the solutions, I don't think gallium, we can publish this and we can understand the physics and chemistry behind it. Uh, I think the solution is to look at something like mercury, right? <laughs> and this is why I'm an advocate to bring mercury back to the system and make it uh, less problematic and its name a better name to start seeing that uh, scientists, engineers start, of course, with care, with caution and with all the protection that they need in the lab to start using it. The other thing is also another possibility is to look at tin. Tin melting point is quite low. If mercury is not possible, let's increase the temperature to that of mel above melting point of tin, 230 degrees, and look at uh, solutions for human being as liquid catalyst from the possibility of using tin. Yeah. Actually, suddenly I have another question because uh, you mentioned the, the gallium is easy to be oxidized and it can be reduced. So I'm thinking about the, for the alloy or the secretion dimers, you, the, the material you synthesize. So when you use them for the CO2 reduction, when you apply the potential, what happened to the surface of, uh, oxidation layer? It oh, can be reduced. Okay. So uh, in that uh, example that we showed to you, we have Syria on the surface, right? Yeah. So Syria was going through sub-stoichiometry Syria and going to four stoichiometry Syria. And because we were applying the voltage, it, it was basically reversible, all good. There was no problem. Oh, cool. But the reality is the surface control is very difficult. Mm. Okay, thanks for your explanation. So you. I, I'll hand the time, the remaining time to others. Thanks again. Thank you. So go ahead, uh, who want to ask the next question? Feel free to unmute yourself. I can go first, if that's okay. okay. All right, uh, great talk. So inspiring and exciting to see the direction that this field's going and um, Thank you for your great presentation. I have a lot of questions, um, probably a lot of them we can have offline, but uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the pulsing experiments where you apply a positive and then I think a negative voltage, and then you would see particles like shedding off of the surface. Um, and the solution was going from kind of like clear to sort of darker. Could you Could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Yes, so how about I show the, let's go back to the screen and to share a screen. And this one, sorry. Let me see where it was. Sorry for that. So that's okay, just um, you're able to share or? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay. 
where was it? Around here. So we're talking about anodic condition, cathodic condition, right? And then uh, the material which is inside the liquid metal have different concentrations. So let's take a look at the video one more time, right? So as you saw, we have deformation and the alloying that happens on the surface, right? And eventually the surface becomes pulled off these nanomaterials, the suspension very quickly in like a few minutes, five minutes here. At actually not very high concentration, we're talking about, for instance, 5% of indium, if I remember. At five minutes, all, every single morsel of indium was coming out of the core of liquid metal to the surface by applying the voltage. Now, conditions are written here. It seems that we are perturbing the surface, and by applying the voltage, the surface becomes the area that tin goes and enriches the surface. So then we apply a negative voltage. So we have the enrichment of the surface by tin, and eventually this tin cannot remain on the surface and should come out. All right, so basically this is an observation. <laughs> Scientifically, what's happening underneath is just guesses. Those guesses can be wrong or right, but uh, the, the fact is that tin comes out in, uh, it seems that the tin atoms, they go to the surface, you get clusters of nanoparticles of tin, because that's what we see in the next page. And uh, basically they go a suspension in the secondary liquid in the electrolyte uh, around liquid metal, and then you can take them out and use them for a different application. I don't know whether Thank you answered the question or not, but yeah, well, I mean, I'd, um, it's so the the particles that come out are metallic, right? No, not necessarily. The surface not is metal oxide. Mm -hmm. The core is metallic. Mm, okay. So yeah, and the moment that they go to electrolyte, they become oxidized. The surface. And they're pure tin. There's, I mean, or more or less pure tin. Yeah, the surface is tin monoxide. If I don't or tin dioxide here. Oh, we have both mm -hmm. of them. So at, in this condition, it was tin dioxide mostly, rather than tin, tin monoxide. Mm -hmm. And it's very, of course, it's stable. And so what is your speculation on like, number one, why they go to the surface and then number two, why they get shedded from the surface? Okay, then it, it goes back to the other issue is, do you remember even without any voltage when, Oh, this was here. We don't even any voltage when we uh, add, for instance, basement. And we just poke the surface with something like our finger. This basement start to go and migration to the surface and make these patterns, right? And it's enriching the surface. What, and the, as I mentioned, we did the, because analytically, we could not say, okay, why it's going to the surface? But when we do the simulation, put all this bismuth around, nucleation start to happen. The condition on the surface actually promotes the nucleation or stop the nucleation. So you and think that maybe the electrochemical reaction to form the gallium oxide, presumably electrochemically, is sort of enhancing the, uh, the amount of tin that would go to the surface? Ten particles be because surface we have electrochemical double layer right mm -hmm. and this double layer when we apply the voltage electric charge goes there or leaves that plate so suddenly of course we have electric field we have the tendency for nucleation to happen near any boundary and uh, now my question is you know it's a metallic material. We apply electric field. Why, why, and why tin from the core goes to the surface? That was my second part of my question. <laughs> right. I'm glad so, you answered my question with a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe it's because of diffusion, and diffusion gradually happens, but eventually 
we almost emptied the liquid metal from tin. Mm. So I suppose if it's just diffusion, it should take much longer than five minutes. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a few thoughts. I'm, I mean, it just it would also just be speculation, but uh, I think I should probably yield the floor to my colleagues and friends. Yeah. Thank you. Before we move to Tobin, that my baby, I can ask a question because you're on this slide. I I also have a question on that um, video showing just that the one you talk of mis bismuth and gallium alloy thing, and you forming different pattern. Is it under different uh, voltage? How those different patterns formed? Yeah. Oh so no no, this happens naturally. Basically, uh, this is not voltage. Uh, this is you have a very, very low concentration of indium, and suddenly the surface becomes enriched with indium when you poke one side of the uh, liquid metal. Then you, so it's like liquid metal is here. You just poke this point, and from that point you have a front that produces these patterns on the surface. So still this but uh, the, the core is liquid. Suddenly you have enrichment of bismuth happening. And it's not voltage. This in this case, it's just boundary just condition. Right, and then those patterns is um, formed. It's like a because you you have different shape of pattern. Is that just a spread on the surface different pattern, or is actually one particular concentration or something? You have this type of pattern. I was just wondering how this pattern is that crystalline sort of um, facety related, or or just distribution. Yeah, Why? so we can see all of these things on the surface, different locations of the surface. Right. Right. And uh, again, you're quite right. There should be a condition uh, that moves our pattern from one to another one. But uh, again, this is observation. And the, the reality is why we have this Turing pattern and why the enrichment to this extent happens, while, for instance, the core is only 0.001% bismuth, surface becomes 50% bismuth, 50% gallium. And if you look at the bismuth on the surface, are they crystalline material with different uh, um, sort of um, uh, crystal facet, or what is, um, what is that? Yeah, we etched out gallium and took bismuth, yeah, there, there are crystal structures. They 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 grow. Actually, what comes out of the liquid metal has a very different crystal phase than what remains inside. So it seems that we have two different types of crystals happening all the time. One is that's promoted by liquid metal, and what is promoted by the boundary. Right. Okay. Thank you, Tobin. Up to you. Well, yeah, again, also thank you for this uh, very, very nice talk here. And I've got one comment and I also have, have a question later on. So first of all, in your discussion, you mentioned that you don't believe that there's enough gallium around uh, uh, to do catalysis. I think you're a little bit too pessimistic. I mean, we are, we're using platinum, palladium, ruthenium every day as catalyst. Mm -hmm. So uh, ruthenium is used on uh, industrial scales now, and we only mine 30 tons a year of ruthenium yeah. globally. So I, I think uh, um, I still have a lot of hope for gallium. So that's my comment. And Actually, uh, uh, if I interrupt you, you're quite yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, I should have used a very accurate word and say there isn't enough gallium produced yeah. because it's moderately abundant. It's all about understanding how to extract them, of course. Exactly. And uh, now my question is, uh, could you just go a little bit more into detail how you get this amazing uh, selectivity in your uh, canola oil experiment? Yeah. So whenever I look at liquid metal catalysts, I, I would expect that you get very poor selectivity because you've got these very um, amorphous uh, inhomogeneous uh, interfaces. So you don't have some clear structure motives. So how do yeah. you really get that selectivity? Because that's not what I would expect. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're quite right. Look, when I said amazing, it's not that amazing. It's like 90% plus. <laughs> that's pretty good, I think, for an amorphous yeah. surface. That's pretty, pretty surprising. Yeah. 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 And uh, this is why we, again, ask our colleagues, Salvi and others, 
I said, okay, we have this selectivity. Is there any way that uh, you just run this molecular simulation and see what you get out of this? So they said, yes, apparently we have this dynamic configuration that if you have a specific concentration of tin and uh, nickel you have here, it's possible perhaps if they can come to the surface and start latching itself to the surface like this, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, selectively, it produces propylene. Uh, it seems that because of this phenomenon which is happening, that means decaying uh, basically mirror itself, the charge that he has around it, mirroring itself on the surface when we have nickel and uh, and uh, and what was the one? I keep forgetting it. Okay, nickel and tin. Mm. Uh, then it can make this kind of structure underneath that selectively disrupts it as a specific location to produce the propylene. So it's some sort of interaction between the actual reactant and the catalyst, effectively, if that makes sense. So that's uh, that's really cute. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, thank you. No problem. And I've got a question from the audience um, um, is who's asking that how to measure oxide sickness with XPS. And also can Raman spectroscopy measure the difference in the oxide layer at different applied voltages? Um, I don't think we can. Well, this is, I don't know whether it's relevant to this uh, talk. But uh, yeah, so for oxide thickness measurements, we generally use the ray, we etch the surface, then till we, for instance, we see the um, XPS peaks, till that XPS peak changes and goes to another XPS peak. And that's the end of, for instance, that oxide layer. So we know how much we're etching each time that we are uh, basically, impinges ray on the surface so we can assess the thickness. What was the other question? And Raman spectroscopy measured the difference in the oxide layer at different applied voltages. Uh, yes, yeah, so we do, we, for instance, with one of the examples, we did in situ Raman spectroscopy to see what's happening. So we have a cell, everything is there, and basically uh, the beam from Raman go to the surface, and we can see in situ what's happening on the surface at different voltages. Okay, thank you. Martin, do you have any question? I think you're uh, waiting very patiently. <laughs> probably I have with too many, but I'm gonna save them uh, uh, for, for later. But I, I can ask you a few of them. And uh, some of it is related to the slide you have out here, and others are on the solidification. If we start here, it's very interesting that you start with a C10 molecule, but the fragments you're getting are C3. Yeah. You have a, a completely symmetric molecule. It's even numbered, but your yeah. product is asymmetric. Yeah. Did you get the same product uh, if you change the stoichiometry of the tin and the nickel? If the ratio changes, do you still get the propylene? Okay, that's a very good question. And uh, this explanation came from our colleagues. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I I think they have done many of the simulation to see which one of them can happen, right? And which one of them should not happen. So they narrow it down to this kind of structure. Again, uh, your question is very important, but uh, more than what I presented, I'm not very sure. Yeah. Because uh, the reason I'm asking that is we... Um, we're interested in understanding the what I would call the stereostructure nature of the oxide. And we tend to assume that the surface of these metals is uh, is completely amorphous. But I think it's when we look at it from a, a single plane, but if you look at it at three dimension, there's a lot of uh, energy balance that is required to establish it. And therefore there is one dimension that is actually very well ordered and, and hierarchical, and we don't pay enough attention to it. And I, right. my guess is that most likely that uh, if you are to map out the energy landscape of your oxide, you will see uh, 
spatially distributed um, minimize and maximize that would align with a, a three carbon about uh, a half a nanometer length. Most likely, that's my guess. Uh, the other question I had is on your patterns, the beautiful uh, certification patterns you, the landfill was asking about. And uh, with those patterns, when I look at them and I look at what we teach in uh, a traditional bulk certification, we expect that the eutectic would give you the laminar structures. But from your, your, your data, you're seeing that the eutectic is giving you the uh, wonky coiled patterns. This is from so the, the, oh, the no, 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 the other ones. Which one? Uh, we pass the slide. What well, you're showing there is spinoro patterns. Uh, sorry, which patterns? Yeah, the other one. Yeah. This one. This one. Okay. This one. Yeah. So if if you look at the your tactic. Is the one that is giving you this uh, distributed structures, yeah, yeah, distributed patterns. But it, the one at the bottom is the one that is going giving you stuff more close to what I would expect. Eighty twenty, this Martin. That's what I would expect for a eutectic lamellar structures. Why do yeah. you see that? Why why do you see that that difference? And uh, is this just in the surface or in the bulk? Okay, so uh, if you look at the paper. We almost see everything, right? I don't say we don't, mm -hmm. but the majority, like I'm, I'm talking about, for example, ninety percent mm -hmm. of uh, what we saw mm -hmm. from uh, tin and bismuth eutectic became fibrous. A again, our guess is because uh, we go from a very uh, high entropy system mm -hmm. and cool it down, so it doesn't have enough time to form a crystal structure. Okay. You're quite right. It depends on, partly on also on uh, cooling down uh, conditions as well. But again, if you go from very highly entropic system, the chance of having amorphous becomes more because they don't have enough time to form themselves into crystals. Could there also be a, a question of service driving the patterns you you get getting? Is there like surface of the taxi? This isn't. This is the core. So it's a snapped. Yeah, but I'm thinking if the surface has already a biased organization, can it actually distort what we expect in the core? You're right. Look again, how far we are from the surface, completely affected by by what's happening in the surface here. Uh, again, these are the statistics came from the core. Again, about the surface it becomes very complicated. <laughs> But, but anyway, right. affects everywhere, yeah. Yeah, very nice talk, very, very detailed. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure to see all the yeah. opportunities that uh, exist in liquid metal. So a, a more general question now. You've shown us a lot of beautiful work, and uh, you've clearly uh, highlighted there's a lot we don't know about liquid metals, and uh, maybe we need to dig in. For this, the person in the audience who would be interested to jump into this field, where do they start? Where do they start? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the, there are opportunities here. The opportunity is, as I mentioned, everything is very easy to work with, right? Yep. So the opportunity is, it's possible to go and buy basically uh, 50 cents of uh, tin and start somewhere. <laughs> And, and everyone can go and melt it in any uh, hot plate and start mixing things together. Now, after that is about using imagination. Okay, so we have uh, access to some of the equipment in the lab. Uh, now, the difficulty is liquid metal. Uh, the beam doesn't penetrate into liquid metals, so we cannot see things. Water, we can see everything inside. Light passes through here, liquid metal, the first challenge is nothing passes through it. Now, what should we do? This is why anytime we saw something come out of the surface nicely, <clears throat> we were very happy, or something comes out of the core. This is why when we apply the voltage, we saw that things come out of the core and we can collect them, but we became really happy. 
Now, uh, this is an observation. Now, what's happening inside this liquid is very important. Uh, I think all this uh, beautiful world and all the opportunities can be there. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, okay, what are the other possibilities is about the surface. Um, again, to my opinion, I had this discussion at the very beginning before we started this um, about cat catalytic properties of liquid metal. Right? Let's go to this. The reality is something simple like this. Very small amount of uh, platinum. <laughs> For the same amount of platinum in solid state, this was extraordinary, okay, extraordinary active. I think if people start working on this, first of all, uh, increasing the surface to volume ratio of Liquid state metal, one of the biggest challenges anytime we have this liquid metal in liquid state, anytime it remains in liquid state, they mesh together. So it's the biggest challenge. How to keep them all far apart from each other. And the second is now we have the opportunity. Everything in liquid state becomes a super catalyst, extraordinary catalyst. At least the numbers show that in some of these very crude measurements. Um Access to them is very easy. You can start with a hot plate or anyone in their lab. They don't need to have high tech. Now, uh, if they can find a smart ways of uh, avoiding this merger to happen, increase the surface to volume ratio at the same time, understanding what's happening on the surface, then uh, they can find some solution for our problems in chemical engineering and producing our feed stock like ammonia to other things, both carbon capture and the rest. So I think the sky is the limit. Uh, there are many things that my, I myself, my group, we don't know. And I'm, I'm sure there are many things other people can think about and see they can move forward with something like this liquid catalyst, how break bonds, how put bonds together. They can make it selective by adding a few components, very easily just add them. It doesn't need long, uh, uh, sorry, basically difficult efforts. We're talking about a few minutes. You can add one more component to it and test it. One more component here and test it. It's not like this that we have to wait days and days to make something in solid state really well controlled. Again, yourself, Martin, is an expert. I'm sure you can think of many other things in addition to what I mentioned. De definitely. I, I think it's an exciting field and it's uh, very interdisciplinary. There's an uh, opportunity for everybody. Yeah, yeah. but thanks for the question. Yeah. Was Thank, you. Thank you very much. Very great talk. Thank you. I think so. this this work is really interesting because when when we talk about the platinum, a very small amount in the liquid state, is that really atomic sort of level? The um the platinum is like in atomic because I heard I'm not really familiar with the field, but I did hear about you know the atomic level a scale um catalyst platinum is actually more effective. So I guess yeah, that's in line with yeah with what people are actually really trying to engineer now to to make it um, that this type of catalyst. So yeah, it's very interesting. How fast is the whole process to generate this? Like you said, a minute. So, so how easy it is to scale up before if you think about large scale production? Okay, that's where the difficulties start to emerge. Large scale production. This is not large scale. Uh, this is just the surface, and yeah. this is something for publication. Now, the moment that you want to do larger scale, the difficulty is how to break the surface and make the smaller size. Okay, we can sonicate it. The moment you sonicate, surface become oxidized, right? If it's an environment that has the smallest amount of oxygen in. Now, that makes the surface less active. One, the moment that you remove the oxygen, these small liquid metal particles that you make and surface area become very large. They go and merge together. The question is how to keep them separate and how to keep the surface still active and how are the gas 
or uh, liquid organic molecules come into the surface can penetrate into the small droplets. They can never penetrate into, for instance, liquid metal. Nothing can of this organic material can dissolve into liquid metal. Everything should happen on the surface. There are many challenges. That's why you keep keep you guys busy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I do anyone have? Uh, does anyone have more questions? We do have uh, time for perhaps one to two quick ones. No, it looks like uh, oh when, yeah. When, when are we having the liquid metal conference? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We need we need to get we need to get a lot of people together to to really dig yeah. into uh, these materials because I, I I think that unless we get people from across disciplines, it's not going to be um, mm. we're not going to get all the answers we need. Uh, we we have limitations in our specific disciplines, and I think with all the interest and all the opportunities, maybe it's time to amplify the voice and invite other people who. Uh, who are not even active right now, but who have orthogonal uh, experiences. So maybe something to think about. Your yeah, you should organize one. I sure, yep. we should be active. We should go ahead and yeah. Uh, the more, the better. It's time to. Uh, many people are involved now. Mm -hmm. the, the mass is there. You're quite right. Okay. Very good. That's a very good uh, outcome of, of after this discussion. We have a conference for liquid metal. With that, I think we need to really wrapping up for tonight. And thank you very much for everyone joining this uh, panel discussion. Very interesting discussion. So now uh, representing ICANX, um, Karosh, here is um, the certificate and also acknowledgement of your uh, your great talk to, um, today. And um, it will be delivered to your mailbox very soon. Thank you. And, Thank you. And the next week, uh, we'll have Econex Talks presented by Professor Lei Yan from Peking University. He'll be talking about optical quantum vector, remote sensing mechanism based on aerospace means. And of course, the following week, we'll have our panelist tonight, uh, Professor Michael Dickey, um, going to talk about application of liquid metal for soft and stretchable devices. So very looking forward to that, Michael. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Sitting 不再的曾经失败放弃或跟上努力才是真的方向 I can, I can 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的力量 I can, I can 你也能够像我一样飞越最高山岗 I can, I can 
奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞、啊。不再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可以阻挡心中无限的。